crowds are always warm. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another one of our wonderful educational seminars with our specialist. Today, we have the very, very lovely Dr. Erwin Grunveld, who is a retina surgeon and opth oil, ophthalmologist, and he has particular areas of expertise, which he will talk to you about. Uh, he has been with us for a little while, and we love his work. We love his reports. Today's um, uh, seminar is on cataract perspectives, which is a really topical um, issue and, and something that we're seeing more and more in various um, reports that we're being asked to provide and as being more and more of an issue. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Today, we have our little guest visitor today, Leroy, the MAG mascot here with us. Um, and look, at the end of the seminar, there will be a time for you to ask some questions of Dr. Grunveld. But in the meantime, may I ask that you please keep your uh, sound on mute so that noise from your home or office doesn't interfere with the recording. If you have to go and you have a question, you can pop it in the chat and uh, I'll read it out at the end for you. Um, otherwise, sit back and enjoy. Over to you, Dr. Grunveld. Thank you very much, Michelle. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Um, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity and the invitation uh, to address the forum today. Um, just a little quick uh, bio on myself. I uh, grew up in Sydney and Brisbane, attended University of Queensland and undertook ophthalmology training at the Royal Victorian Iron Air Hospital. As you've heard, my uh, principal area of interest is uh, vitro-retinal surgery, but I, I do cataract surgery. I do a lot of cataract surgery and uh, I do uh, aspects of general ophthalmology. Um, altogether, I've probably performed several thousand cataract procedures. Uh, my practice is located in Brisbane CBD, and uh, I've been doing independent medical exams uh, for probably uh, the better part of about 25 years, uh, but probably in, in greater numbers in recent times. Um, in addition to private practice, I have worked as a visiting medical officer in my subspecialty area, supervising junior doctors in the public hospitals for over 20 years. Um, my topic for this meeting today is cataract perspectives, uh, objectives and outcomes with particular reference to clinical elements and the uh, independent medical examiner aspects. Uh, my intention is that you will leave this session with a better understanding and insight into the management of lens disease, both lens disease and refractive error, uh, which as you'll see, um, uh, is overlapping in this, uh, in, in what I present to you today. Um, just a quick thing to, just a quick question to ponder is um, you know, how much permanent impairment do cataracts cause? Um, and uh, in general, uh, the answer is uh, cataracts do not cause permanent visual impairment. The answer is zero. However, surgical complications that arise from cataract surgery or in the, um, in the totality of how a cataract might uh, develop, uh, such as trauma, can cause uh, permanent damage. And uh, frequently, uh, the issue with cataracts is not so much what happened during the surgery, but it's how the decision was made to do the operation. And as you'll see in the case that I present, what the expectations were uh, of the patient and of the surgeon. Uh, so um, the outline uh, of the talk is that uh, first part is going to be clinical perspectives. Uh, I'll talk about our normal clinical assessment, indication for operations, preparation for surgery, and uh, the sorts of uh, refractive outcomes uh, that we target. Um, the second part will be more of a, uh, a uh, laser-like look at the expert witness perspectives. Um, we see a range of uh, different presentations from workplace injuries to road trauma, to medical misadventures or negligence, disciplinary tribunals, regulatory agencies, consumer complaints, fraud over-servicing. So there's quite a spectrum. And then, as I mentioned, the, the final uh, part of the talk is about an actual case presentation that I dealt with in my own practice. 
So um, going back to the beginning, the uh, clinical perspectives uh, really revolve around our definition of what is a carac. So um, this is a, a picture of a very dense, uh, visually significant carac. Um, but in, in truth, a cataract is anything that causes a little, causes a little bit of uh, lack of clarity in the lens of the eye. So what we're looking through here is the lens that we can't see, which is in the front of the eye, and that's the cornea. Uh, behind the cornea is the iris, which is the colored part of the eye that you can see there. And this pupil is widely dilated. So we can see straight down into the second lens of the eye, which is a variable focus lens. And this is the lens that we are talking about when we talk about cataracts. The cornea is a fixed lens. It's a structural component of the outside wall of the eye. So, you know, although uh, surgery is performed on the cornea for other reasons, we generally try to stay away from the cornea, especially when we're doing cataract surgery because there are cells on the inside uh, of, on the inside layer of that cornea that maintain the clarity of the cornea. It's very important that we don't disturb those cells during surgery. So the, the question, big question really, that is central to you know, current practice in lens-based surgery is what actually is the difference between a visually significant cataract requiring surgery, such as this one in the picture, uh, versus a refractive lens exchange. Fundamentally, the surgery is exactly the same, but it comes down to needs and wants. So when someone has a visually significant cataract, then we're saying clinically that they have symptoms caused by the cataract that are interfering with their normal activities of daily living. Uh, when someone comes for a refractive lens exchange, we're talking about someone whose lens is clear, who does not have a cataract, but who doesn't want to wear glasses or contact lenses. Uh, and so then it becomes a, a juxtaposition between needs and wants. And there is an element of subjectivity in it. And what can become a little confusing is that at that interface where it's a gray decision as to whether surgery is required or surgery is not required, the patient's motivation needs to be explored because sometimes patients come expecting that the surgery that's going to take away their cataract is actually going to take away their glasses or contact lenses and the cataract isn't causing much trouble for them at all. So this is one of the things that we try to establish uh, in our initial preoperative assessment. The way that we do that is we check the refraction and the refraction is the degree to which vision can be improved by putting optical lenses in front of the eye and determining what component of the visual impairment is reversible uh, and what component is being caused by the actual cataract. Uh, the refraction consists of a what is called a spherical component, which a spherical lens is a lens that has equal power in all directions, and often an astigmatic component, which is when a lens has differential power in different directions. So it would be optically a little more like a football shape and a basketball shape. Then we have a range of intraocular lenses that we can introduce into the eye to replace the lens that we've removed when we take the cataract out. And um, those lenses may be monofocal lenses or multifocal lenses with a combination of astigmatism correction or without astigmatism correction. So when a lens has astigmatism correction built into it, then we call that type of lens a toric lens. Now, there, there is a lot to understand about the optics of these lenses, but in, in general terms, when someone wants to have 
spectacle prevision after cataract surgery, uh, then we generally move towards using a multifocal style of intraocular lens. Multifocal intraocular lenses cause degradation of the clarity of vision. They, there is some loss of resolution and there's some loss of contrast sensitivity. And in many cases, they can cause increased glare sensitivity, halos around lights and reduced ability to drive motor vehicles at night. And the, so this is uh, a case where the preoperative counselling is very important and, uh, and we need to make patients understand uh, that there are compromises involved uh, when you aim uh, to be spectacle free. I'll say a little bit more about aims of surgery shortly. Um, another way of looking at this uh, difference between the two uh, indications for surgery is it's uh, disease versus wellness. And uh, often in the case of refractive lens exchange surgery, it then also becomes a, a issue of affordability because refractive lens exchange surgery is not funded by Medicare. And uh, if it's funded at all by private health funds to a very, very limited degree. Uh, so patients are paying out of pocket for the surgery, which is going to cost them somewhere in the order of $5,000. So uh, that's just, uh, and uh, it's because of this, um, because of this sort of uh, economic imperative, the patients presenting for lens exchange surgery, expect to get value for their money. So they expect to be free of spectacles once they've had the surgery done. Now, from a surgical perspective, irrespective of whether it's a refractive lens exchange operation or whether it's a cataract operation, <clears throat> uh, our first aim is to deal with the surgical roots. Now, looking at the mountain climber here in the picture, uh, this is a chap who's climbed up a peak in, in what are known as the Cascade Mountains in Washington State, very close to the Canadian border. And this is a very advanced uh, level of mountaineering that's required to get up these peaks. This individual has spent years and years and years and years acquiring the skills that he uh, needs to apply in, in order to lead this climb, and he's putting his body on the line. Fortunately, as a surgeon, we don't have to put our body on the line too often, uh, but in his case, uh, if he makes a mistake, uh, then it's all over. And in these particular mountains, one experienced climber dies every season, once a year, uh, because they've fallen off the mountain. And mostly that's on the way down the mountain, not the way up the mountain. So there are surgical risks and we, and we need to address those surgical risks. There's a risk of infection. There's a risk of operative surgical complications uh, because of um, the uh, type of equipment that we need to use, which is uh, you know, the, the, the application of an ultrasonic probe inside the eye uh, to remove the cataracts. There's a one in 50 to one in 300 risk of uh, capsule rupture, of um, breaching the chamber that we're working within and having fragments of lens and material uh, uh, float down into the back uh, chamber of the eye. There's a, there's a risk of cystoid macular edema, which is a condition of swelling of the retina, which um, can occur in uncomplicated surgery that is caused by the back and forth movement of the eye as we uh, perform surgery, uh, whilst the eye is being infused to be to remain pressurized, and that causes a sort of trampoline effect inside the eye that can uh, influence the blood vessels within the retina and cause leaking from those blood vessels. So I've mentioned there's a risk of corneal decompensation. Uh, there's a risk of high intraocular pressures even in uncomplicated surgery in the early post-operative period. And those pressures can sometimes be high, high enough to choke off the central retinal artery or to damage the optic nerve. Uh, there's a risk to the iris, which is a colored part of the eye. There's a risk that the iris can become incarcerated in the wound. 
and then there is a risk uh, that uh, the retina at the back of the eye can become detached in the early or later post-operative period. In addition to this, there are the anaesthetic risks. There's a risk of sedation uh, in elderly people in particular uh, who have very little reserve capacity uh, in their respiratory system. And there's, there's a risk of sharp needles uh, attached to local anaesthetic injections which can penetrate the eye or can penetrate the optic nerve. Um, and there are the comorbidities, the diabetes, obesity, and uh, arthritic conditions that interfere with the positioning of people during surgery. There are a lot of moving parts. And there's a lot to be thinking about. Um, measurement and refractive targets are always in the back of our mind because uh, this is what uh, the uh, object of the um, implantation of intraocular lens is, is to rehabilitate the um, optical characteristics of the eye. And um, so we're, and as you'll see, there's always a little bit of plus and minus variance because it relies on uh, measurements, which are over very short distances and involve very, very high uh, power in, uh, lenses that are placed in the eye. So our refractive objectives, um, we, when we're placing a lens in the eye, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer there, but uh, there's a clear lens and a cataract lens there. Um, we've, we've got to think about what's the near focus, what's the distance focus, uh, what's the level of astigmatism, and um, what, what are the compounding effects of very small variances in the, the placement of the intraocular lens inside the eye. We, we use different formulae to calculate the power of these lenses depending on exactly how long the eye is. The length of the eye will determine which formula we use. Um, and that's for comp complex mathematical reasons. Uh, and we, we use very sensitive equipment uh, for, for measuring, for doing biometry, which is the measurement of the length of the eyeball, which can be done with uh, a laser vision, or a laser light rather, or ultrasound. Uh, we have equipment that measures curvature of the cornea. Uh, we have equipment that can measure the topography or variance in the curvature of the cornea. And um, we we'll always look at the alignment of the lens inside the eye. So uh, a lot of this work is uh, performed by clinical assistants uh, in the uh, clinics prior to surgery. So there's a lot of preoperative planning that goes into uh, establishing what's the best lens for the individual case, for the individual person. The comorbidities that we're dealing with during surgery uh, include the hardness of the lens, uh, a condition that weakens the structures that hold the lens in place, which is called pseudo exfoliation, uh, how big the pupil is, whether it can be easily dilated with, uh, with topical eye drops, or whether the pupil doesn't dilate. If the pupil doesn't dilate, it's very difficult to do the surgery, and it's very difficult to shine light into the eye in such a way that sufficient light is reflected back to properly visualize the cataract. So it leads to poor view. And if we have a situation of what's called floppy iris, where the iris is tending to want to um, uh, herniate out through the small 2.4 incision that we've made to enter the eye, uh, then, then we can be in a world of trouble. In addition to that, uh, there's a patient cooperation, they're partly sedated, they're often frail, uh, they're susceptible to mo uncontrolled movements uh, and to suddenly awaking after having been sound asleep. There's positioning issues and, uh, and sometimes they're a little cognitively challenged or confused during the surgery. Uh, the medical conditions, whether they're on anticoagulants, what they're cardiac history is, what drugs they're using. Uh, and um, there are the things that we don't know about uh, that uh, are in the mix. 
In addition to that, we've got scrub teams, we've got scout teams in the operating theatres uh, who are getting instruments and uh, um, injectables ready for us. And we've got the anaesthetic team. Outside the theatre, there's the support and recovery team. And inside the theatre, as you can see, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of equipment there. There are a lot of things to keep watching. We have uh, intraoperative checklists. Uh, we do safe site checks before we do an operation where everyone comes together. We confirm who we're operating on, which eye we're operating on, and what operation we're doing. Uh, and uh, and you know, at the end of the list, where there's time, we sometimes have a debrief, particularly if it's been a complicated uh, day. Consent issues are very important. Uh, it's important that patients understand exactly why they're having the surgery, uh, what the risks are, uh, and um, what the logistics uh, and expectations for post-operative care are. Uh, the patient needs to accept uh, the proposal. Uh, it will be based on their perception and the information that they've gleaned about the surgery. We go through the risks and, um, and then we create the expectations. We want to know, are they a spectacle wearer? Do they wear contact lenses? What do they do in their spare time? Are they actively retired or are they inactively retired? Uh, what's their life stage? Um, the outcomes of surgery from a patient's perspective, they all assume that the surgical objectives will be met. They're only interested in how well they can see. Uh, so uh, the, the expectation is that everything will be fine. Uh, when we do the post-operative assessment, we're looking at lens placement, the cornea, checking for uh, fluid in the retina, uh, and understanding that um, some patients will finish up with symptoms such as floaters in their vitreous that we can't do too much about. And sometimes the lenses will need uh, re-rotation in the early post-operative period. So there, there is a, a little bit of room uh, to modify the result, but mostly uh, within about three months of the surgery, it's set and it's very difficult uh, to adjust the position of the lens. Okay, part two, looking at it from an expert witness perspective. Uh, cataracts alone, from a work injury perspective, are uh, easily dealt with. Uh, it's a case of do they need surgery because they're interfering with vision? And if so, uh, take the cataract out, put a new lens in. The, the level of permanent visual impairment uh, comes from associated injuries, associated injuries to the eye, or to the orbit. And orbital injuries uh, predominantly uh, are bony injuries, which affect soft tissue, such as the muscles that control the eye. So uh, road trauma, so work injuries mostly are going to be cataract, ocular, and orbital. Uh, road trauma, on the other hand, will be cataract plus ocular, orbital, facial, brain, spine, organs, skin, joints, limbs, Often uh, these patients have been in the intensive care unit for days or weeks uh, before we get to see them. And uh, there, there are a lot of comorbidities to have to deal with. Then the group who come because of some form of negligence, usually it's because of, uh, in, in relation to cataract surgery, it's usually because they're unhappy about the refractive outcome of surgery. Uh, it may be that they're still having to wear glasses, or it may be that they've had uh, a consequential injury to the cornea or that the, the lens uh, has caused some uh, collateral damage during placement. Um, not so common to see negligence uh, cases around cataract surgery, much more common to see work-related and road trauma injuries. Disciplinary tribunals, not very common, usually relates to performance, conduct and communications. Um, often it's about the relationship that's developed between the parties involved. Uh, and then regulatory agencies, fraud, Medicare panels, 
this really relates to um, to financial fraud or to over-servicing, which is not common. Um, looking at how we assess permanent impairment of the visual system, uh, essentially there are formulae and tables, depends on which version of the AMA guides we're working with. Uh, in, in the case of um, patients who have less than 50% of impairment of their visual system, that then becomes equivalent to whole person impairment. And if it's more than 50%, there's a sort of a pro rata scale uh, that uh, is roughly about 0.7 of the degree of impairment. Um, the elements that we look at that are critical for that evaluation of permanent impairment what is the best corrected visual acuity? That's the visual acuity with the best pair of lenses in place. And we look at that predominantly for the distance, but sometimes also for near vision. Uh, then we look at the visual fields. What's the central visual field looking like, the central 30 degrees? And then what's the peripheral? It's much more heavily weighted towards the central visual fields and it's more heavily weighted to the lower part of the central visual fields. So, so there's a disproportionate um, uh, representation in the final impairment rating. Uh, and this is done with either with formulae or reference to tables, depending on, on the addition uh, of the guides. Binocular single vision is an important area, particularly for motor vehicle trauma, uh, because double vision, permanent double vision can be quite disabling. Where there's been damage to the bone in the orbit, it can sometimes not be possible to surgically restore the alignment of the two eyes working together. So it may be that uh, patients will have permanent double vision. What we're interested in is whether that's permanent when they're looking straight ahead, or is it permanent when they're looking down, or is it permanent when they're looking to the side or up? The two most important areas are whether they're looking straight ahead or whether they're looking down, because as adults, we spend most of our time looking straight ahead or down. As children, we spend most of our time looking straight ahead or up. Uh, the other areas that come into play are stereo acuity, depth perception, glare sensitivity, activities of daily living, and watery eyes. There's an, an allowance in the guides, which is called an individual adjustment. The percentage of individual adjustment varies. Uh, and these variations can be significant. AMA4, for example, deals very differentially with double vision and aphakia. Aphakia is a condition where there is no lens in the eye. And in AMA4, it's possible to be very well compensated up to 25% of the impairment of the visual system from aphakia. And uh, when you add diplopia, together with the individual adjustment variance, uh, the, the, just for those two areas, individual adjustment and diplopia in AMA4, there's about 35% of uh, discretionary variance. Whereas in AMA5 and AMA6, that discretionary variance is uh, no more than 15% and uh, significantly reduced by the formula that are used. So it's important to know, and, and of course, GEPI, GEPI is the Queensland version of the impairment guides. And GEPI, as far as ophthalmology is concerned, predominantly closely follows AMA4. So there's not really very much difference between GEPI and AMA4. Um, in general, AMA4 in Queensland is used for work cover uh, and for road trauma and other um, reasons. Uh, we generally find AMA5 being used. Okay, part three, case history. Uh, this is a complaint which I handled last year. This was a patient of mine. Uh, He's a 65-year-old Caucasian. Uh, he arrived with some glare sensitivity, reduced distance vision, and a, a visually significant cataract. He, was, he works on computers. He plays golf. He's in good health, no medications. Previously, he had a hyperopic refractive requirement, which means that his visual system optically was underpowered and he needed extra power to see clearly in focus 
both for the distance and up close. Uh, he had confirmed cataract opacification at slit lamp, and he had no other ocular pathology. He had uncomplicated surgery. We put a monofocal lens in. We targeted a distance refractive outcome of minus 0.3 diopters, which is a very, very small minus correction that will put people into clear focus between the horizon line and the very far intermediate uh, area of their visual field. Uh, that's, that, that comes with a long depth of focus and is the most useful refractive outcome. Uh, and uh, he said he was happy to wear reading spectacles, uh, but he would prefer to be free of spectacles in the distance. And this was where we came unstuck with it because he, he could see more clearly uh, with spectacles in the distance, even though his distance visual acuity unaided was 6'6", and his near vision was N5. But with correction, he could come up to 6'4.5". So we were happy, he was unhappy. And um, he had uh, read through this uh, preoperative, um, whoops, this preoperative, um, just sorry, I've mixed. There we go. He'd read through this chart preoperatively, which says that uh, you know, uh, the dependence on spectacles uh, can't be guaranteed, falls under a bell curve. And um, in, in essence, 80% of people will be spectacle free for 80% of the time. Some people do better than that. Uh, so he'd, he'd signed that questionnaire uh, for all intents and purposes, we we're all on the same page. Um, so you can imagine my surprise when I received this letter. Uh, he'd, he'd taken advice from the Office of the Health Ombudsman about his disappointing refractive outcome. Uh, he uh, felt that uh, he wanted to know what had gone wrong with the surgery. Uh, he was concerned that he'd had pain, trauma, and uh, excessive expense. Um, and uh, he'd, he thought that his vision would be improved in the left eye to the point where he'd be free of spectacles uh, and, and on and on and on um, uh, with the outcome that uh, he was wanting to have the whole cost of his surgery reimbursed and uh, he forwarded a list of his costs. So we looked at that very carefully as we always would. And um, we were deeply disappointed to receive his letter and curious as to what his expectation was. Um, we pointed out to him that there had been no complication with the surgery, uh, that we had uh, taken all of our usual measurements, uh, that we'd benchmarked our results against international best practice, um, and um, that you know, his post-operative care had, had been completely uncomplicated. Um, he um, uh, did have a minor tear film deficiency. Uh, when we saw him postoperatively, we dealt with that. We gave him some treatment for it. His visual acuity improved to normal. There was no permanent injury. So the Office of the Health Ombudsman didn't accept the complaint. And uh, they uh, said to him that he would need to deal with that on an individual basis with us. We wrote him this letter and the bottom line uh, was that uh, we were not going to refund his costs. Uh, we believe that uh, his request lacked merit. Uh, and whilst we understood that he was disappointed with the outcome of the surgery, uh, there was nothing that we would have done any differently about it. Fundamentally, the problem in this case was that his expectations of surgery and our expectations of surgery were misaligned. And that, that was at the root cause. So no matter you know, how well, we think we have prepared surgery, uh, patients for surgery. There's always the possibility that we'll get an outlier and probably one in three or 400 cataract patients will, have it, will be disappointed despite the fact that we think they've had a very good result. So that's basically it. Um, uh, that's the end of the talk. Uh, I think uh, sensor site's critical. Uh, and it ranks very highly in quality of life assessments. Uh, so gaining an understanding of the critical elements that contribute to impairment 
uh, hopefully has provided some uh, valuable insight. Thank you, and uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Grunwald. That was really, really interesting. Um, I was I was particularly interested in the the discussion of cataracts not necessarily needing to be removed. So, if it's not causing significant <clears throat> vision, you would not recommend removal. Uh, no, and uh, I frequently have this discussion very frequently with patients because as soon as their optometrist tells them that they have a cataract, they want a referral to the ophthalmologist. Very often they arrive with a, a cataract that is in a very early stage, it's not visually significant and really is not a surgical proposition for years. And I often say to them that as surgeons, we don't send the tow truck until the accident has happened. Right. Fair point. Looks like, James, you might be wanting to ask a question. I, yes, uh, Doctor, I have a question concerning um, consent. Um, I've been asked to look into a matter where uh, for an elderly patient who um, suffered fragments of the lens falling into the retina um, during the phaco emulsification process yep. and <clears throat> um, consequently making his his vision much worse than it was before he had that procedure. Now, he, his uh, concern is that this was not, he wasn't warned of this possibility. Uh, and from what I've seen from the hospital notes, we only have a general form of consent, which, which is in, is couched in very general terms and certainly doesn't go to the specific um, mis uh, event which occurred here. Yeah. Would it, would it be likely to be found somewhere else in, in the information this gentleman might have been provided or would it be? Um, it depends. It depends. In our case, I, I mean, I can say what we do in our clinic here, uh, but it, it's variable and certainly public hospitals very different to private clinics. What we do every time, automatically in the clinic, every time we take biometry measurements, whether we're going to use those measurements or whether we're not going to use those measurements. The patients automatically view three uh, educational videotapes. One is about um, the procedure. Uh, one is about uh, intraocular lens choices. And one is about complications and downside and, um, and risks of surgery. When I get to see them and I'm consenting them for surgery, I always put a note, notation in a mnemonic in my notes that I've spoken to them about the risk of infection, the risk of bleeding, uh, the risk of uh, retinal detachment, and the risk of operative you know, complications such as the one you mentioned, mm -hmm. which when they go badly, could lead to permanent loss of vision, uh, loss of the eye, or in the case of an anaesthetic misadventure, uh, if they were to have a very bad reaction to a drug that was used, there could be anaphylaxis and loss of life. Mm -hmm. So that they, 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 they get a, a kind of a confirmation of the summary of all of what they have seen in the video and, and that's, I then make that notation in my notes and I witness the consent with them. So what people do, what individual surgeons do, the actual detail of what they do is very important. The actual conversation that they have is very important, but also the, what the clinic does in the preamble, what, what happens, what your clinical assistants do in the workup period uh, is important because it's hard sometimes for people to remember all of what was said in a consultation. And it's very hard for us in the short time that we have to be really comprehensive about every single aspect of it. Uh, but we need to make certain that they have received that information. Yeah, uh, so you, I guess what you're saying is you, have to, you would have to look beyond Simply the operator, the the hospital file. Maybe look to the surgeon's um, personal. Yes. Um, what, what, yeah. What What's the protocol? What's the clinic protocol? Yeah. 
Um, I mean, this fellow says if, if he had been warned of this, he wouldn't have gone through with it because his condition, he was only, he only had some mild night driving issues that he was looking to correct. And he, he wouldn't have, if he thought this was a risk, he says he wouldn't have gone through with it. But I, I find it hard to believe he wouldn't have been warned about it mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah, but mostly I, I would think, you know, in the current era particularly, I mean, you know, it was very different 15 or 20 years ago. But in the current era, it would surprise me that someone fronts up for cataract surgery without having been warned that, uh, you know, an intraocular operation can cause loss of vision. Mm. Yeah, Certainly, I, James, we find that as well in, in some of the medical negligence matters that, that pass through our, our triage service. Mm. Um, and, and we have had instances where, like Dr. Grunveld, they have shown a video in their rooms to the person uh, but then the person says, I was never given yeah, a pamphlet, I was never told anything, but the, the doctor's record is able to demonstrate that they were shown the video. Um, and then the other one that we see is um, actually at the public hospital, the nurse, usually it's an anaesthetic assistant who talks to the person before they're given the anaesthetic in the sort of pre-surgical area, says, has the doctor discussed with you the risks of this surgery? And, and there's a tick, yes or no. And if it's no, that they are alerted to go and get the doctor back again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention the other thing that we do is we email the link to those videos which are on our web, on a close part of our website. We email those links to the patient so they can share them with relatives. So that's very important. Mm. Yes, it's assuming they have an email. This is an elderly gentleman who probably who doesn't. <laughs> anyway, yes. yeah, yeah. there's uh, certainly anyway. a lot to look into, isn't there? Uh, there is a lot, and I, I think I need to look a bit deeper. I'm very suspicious about the whole thing, though, because it's it's a procedure that took place at a very reputable hospital with, in Sydney with a very reputable um, specialist. So I don't want to, yeah. you know, I don't want to make uh, um, unfounded yeah. allegations against anyone. No, mm -hmm. you, you, you need to, you, you, I mean, it should be pretty easy to get the answers. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, terrific. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh. Does anyone else have some questions they'd like to ask? Lovely. You know when that happens? It's because the presentation was so good. <laughs> Thank you so much for thank making the time to speak with us, Doctor, and thank you all of you who made the time to join us today. Um, the recording of this session will be sent to you within about a day. Um, but of course, as always, it's available on our YouTube channel, which you can access via YouTube by searching us by name or from your Mag Connect login in the menu bar under the term Mag Seminars. Um, if you have a seminar that you would like us to present, a doctor you'd like to hear from, a topic that you'd like to know about, please contact me and let me know and I will make it happen. Doctor, thank you again. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.